So we're going to continue on this uh, message series. Like he said, we talked last week about angels. And if you weren't here, go back, watch it, or listen to it, because I do think it kind of gives us more of an idea of what angels really are. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the dark side. And should we be fearful? Not if you have Jesus. Let me explain something to you. You have power. Just like I prayed at the beginning, it says when we had Jesus as our Savior that we actually can can direct and just demand that evil flees from us in the name of Jesus. So it, it, the God's word is so powerful. And if you don't read it, you should because you're missing out on so many tactics that you could be using against the enemy. So anyway, get started here real quick. I'm going to have to put on my old lady glasses. I always say that I preach with a disadvantage. Um, one, that I preach like I'm an old. It hurts to even stand here sometimes. <laughs> And then I got the old lady, lady thing. Cameron said he didn't sleep. I said, yeah, I got old lady insomnia, I think, too. I don't know what's happening to me. I'm falling apart. But thankfully, I have Jesus. If I do completely, he'll put me back together again. So anyway, there is a great fascination with the invisible world out there, isn't there? I think that if you remember um, bookstores, do you guys remember bookstores? Yes. <laughs> You know, before Amazon took over everything, we had bookstores. And I loved to go to bookstores. Bookstores were the best thing. Like, if you went for the day, you'd go get your little cup of coffee or something, and you'd go and you'd go sit in a bookstore and look around. Tons and tons of information about the spiritual aspects of things. You know, the, the angels. I mean, you could look for angels and angel books everywhere. Um, demons, that kind of idea. You could see them everywhere. They're all over the place. But people definitely want to know what's going on out there. Up there, all around us, they want to know what it is that's actually happening. And I think there's a lot of confusion that's come out of that. I think there's probably been some books that were really written that were not necessarily uh, breathed from God. They may more breathed from the demons and the enemy. And I think that a lot of people really are obsessed with them. And uh, the thing is, you know, the Bible tells us some interesting things. And I think that um, a lot of really what goes against what we've been talked about, or we've, we've been told in, in books and different things around us, and movies and all that. Um, we talked last week that angels definitely don't look like we thought they did, right? How many of you guys were really surprised about what <laughs> angels really look like? Yeah. I think most of us are really surprised when we see what angels truly look like. And then obviously the one I broke everyone's heart, because poor old grandma, everyone told you this someday, you know, a long, long time ago, that when people die, they become angels. It's not true. It's not in the Bible. The Bible says that angels existed even before humans, and we don't direct over and you know, change over to something else that we're not. So the thing is that we really need to understand about angels is that we're never supposed to direct our prayers to them. We're never supposed to pray to anything that God created because he is the creator of all things, and we should always pray to him, to God in Jesus' name. So I explained to you, that, like I said, angels were created before everything, and their job is really to watch over all the world and, you know, to serve him by doing his will. Even the word angel means messenger, and uh, these are spiritual beings. Um, we talked about how they can show up. They can become either invisible or they could show up as mere men or, you know, they could be, you know, quite scary, as we showed you last week. I mean, I think if all of us saw an angel, even good angels, we would be freaked out. It'd be kind of scary. Well, we shouldn't really fear them. But the thing is, God created angels to be good and holy. Now you're probably thinking, why are you talking so much about angels? Aren't we going to talk about demons? Well, there's going to be something interesting you're going to learn about that. So you might be surprised that angels, all angels, even though they were created to be good, did not all continue to be good. And some of them chose to be quite evil. Um, I told you God created them before mankind was created. And so the Bible actually tells us angels are below God but they are actually superior to us. And it says, though, if one day, if, if, if and when you're perfected like Jesus, that means if you accept Jesus as your Savior and you go on to follow him and you actually do reach heaven, that someday, the Bible tells us, that we will be the ones that are actually going to judge angels. And you're thinking, judge angels? Aren't angels all good? No, they're not. And this is why we're called to judge them. So we learn in the creation story that God calls everything he created good. So we can see in that that angels at the beginning were good, right? If all things were good except for one thing, which was what? That man had no mate. That was the only thing that God says in the creation story that was not good. So the thing is we can understand that obviously angels were created to be good beings. 
And using that standard, like I said, we can see that obviously this plan of God was that all things, all things created, all things that were, were created by him would be good. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. So God actually had this angel, one of them named Lucifer, who actually goes and he rebels against God. And then what he does is he actually causes a third of the angels to actually rebel against God also. This Old Testament um, scripture verse actually describes Lucifer in Ezekiel 28, 14 through 17. It says, I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created and until the day evil was found in you. Your rich commerce led you to violence, and you sinned. So I banished you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. So we can see that Lucifer was beautiful. He actually was very, very beautiful, which is an interesting thing because the Bible actually tells us there was nothing beautiful about Jesus. There was nothing in him that caused people to draw to him as far as beauty. He was just a normal, everyday man. But Lucifer was beautiful. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. So I threw you to the ground and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. There's another scripture. Let me read you. It's in Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. It says, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to the lowest depths. So you can see this fight, this fight that's already brewing. It's taken place. There's the good and there's evil. So we can see that Lucifer was not satisfied. He wasn't satisfied to be one of God's favorite angels. One that actually, what he, the Bible says that he was a, a cherubim, one of the angels that was actually guarding the Garden of Eden. The ones that had the uh, four different faces, the idea that he would, an eagle and an ox and, you know, uh, blanking, human, <laughs> and all those different faces. So we can see that it's not that. He had, all these, he had all these different things. He had all this power and all this authority, and he had this place where he could rule and then he turned against God because he became prideful. What's interesting about the Garden of Eden is, is actually, it's kind of like a picture of what we're going to receive in the, the end. You know, when you talk about the Garden of Eden, it was actually a place where everything collided at once. I mean, you had human beings, you had animals, you had angels, and you had God all walking and living together in this place until even evil, you know, happened and, and people decided to fall against, uh, go against what God would want. So actually what Le Lucifer does is he actually plans a coup. He actually plans a, a coup. He decides he's going to go against God and then he says to the other angels, a third of the angels, that they also should rebel against God. This is the, uh, the same Lucifer that's actually described later on as Satan, obviously, um, the devil, the serpent, the dragon, the prince of darkness, the antichrist, the father of lies, lies, uh, Beelzebub, Mephistopheles, the tempter, the accuser, and even more names that are actually spoken. In Revelation 12, 7, 8, and 9, it says, Then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon lost the battle. And he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. So we can see there's this whole battle that takes place. A lot of times, you know, we, we just, we go to church, we don't stop and think that there's a spiritual battle that took place and is still taking place today around us. Unfortunately, it was then that Satan um, came to earth, and then is when his minions started haunting the earth and kind of trying to deceive people away from God. You know, we, we, we see that, you know, the minions obviously look pretty, you know, pretty easygoing little creatures. Aren't they something that you could kind of, you know, work on and, and, you know, they do great things. But thing is, minions in, like, cartoons are not the same as the minions of the demons, of devils. So there is this fight of good and evil. It's prophetically, 
prophetically you know, talked about from the very beginning of time, and it goes on to the very end of time. We sit somewhere in the middle of this, right? We sit somewhere in the middle of all this fight. And I think sometimes we really don't understand that this is still a fight, that this fight is still continuing, that what the, what the fallen angels wanted or what demons want is their whole idea is that they actually can take more with them. So it's this fight that takes place. So this third of an angels that are fallen, I mean, there's some people that say that's not necessarily true. There is scriptures that talk about, it says a third were wiped out of the stars in, in the heavens, so they think that that's where they got the third of angels that actually were the ones. It's not specifically mentioned that there was a third fallen angels, but this is where the idea was taken from. So these fallen angels that were thrown out of heaven, are they what we would call demons? Are they the ones? I mean, obviously he talks about those, you know, devil and his angels, fallen angels, will be thrown down into hell. So we can see that might be the case. Well, this is the majority view. The majority view is that demons are fallen angels. These angels that actually rebelled and went against God. There is a minority view, and this is what's going to really freak you out. Okay, I'm going to just like scare you. You're going to be like, what in the world? Maybe you read this before, maybe you heard it, maybe you didn't. But then a minority, minority view is that demons are the spirits of the Nephilim. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible, you read about the Nephilim. The Nephilim were supposedly, they were the fallen angels that came. Fallen angels came down, they saw human women. They had unnatural relations with them. We all know that what means, right? I mean, you guys are all adults, you know what unnatural relations means? They got busy, okay? So they got real busy. And what happened is these spirits out of this union, this union that was created from these Nephilim, these giants that roamed the face of the earth, were killed in the great flood when Noah, you know, the whole great flood happened. And these spirits had no place to go because they were half human. So these half human, uh, half fallen angel creations could not go to heaven, could not go to hell, so they roamed the face of the earth, and they look for bodies now to live in. So I don't know which one you believe in, the majority of what people believe, just it's fallen angels, or if they are the spirits of the created beings of the Nephilim and angels, you know. But either way, be afraid. <laughs> be afraid. I don't know why sometimes we're always trying to figure these things out, but sometimes we just don't have enough fear of <laughs> like stay away from these things. So what do demons look like? Well, I think if we can see that they're fallen angels, if we believe that, then what do they look like? They probably look like angels, right? I don't think that necessarily have changed their whole idea of what they look like, but like we talked about with angels, they also can change their appearance. They can come down as, you know, mere men. Um, they could show up as in an animal. They can do all these different things that um, we talked about like, like last week. You know, obviously the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, it says, Paul actually says, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So sometimes we can see that even if Satan does, that obviously demons could do that, right? So a lot of the things that we could consider good or pleasing to the eye might actually be demonic. I think this is a far cry from what you know, we have as actually seen in the Bible or uh, and in cartoons, not in what's been in the Bible. I mean, you can see that there's cartoons, uh, depictions of what Satan and his demons look like. I mean, we can see that they always usually have their bright red, their scaly. Uh, they have tails, you know, forked tails, maybe carrying a pitchfork and that kind of idea, which actually comes from the Bible. I mean, if you, you read, you can kind of see where they got that idea from the Bible of describing Satan or his demons like that because the verses in the Bible describe him as a crafty and deceptive serpent, a beast with horns and a tail. But the truth is that they could actually show up, demons and Satan could show up as a beautiful angel of light. Like I said, or a simple man or girls, as a beautiful man. Some of you guys might now be thinking, yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense with my last relationship, <laughs> right? But think about that. Sometimes we're really deceived at what we think is evil. And we really don't take into account the fact that the Bible says there's a lot of deceptive creatures, a lot of things that perceive themselves as light and good when they're anything but. So demons, no doubt, can take after their master in this regard. 
they can show up the same way. I mean, after all, if you think about it, what's more effective? Someone that shows up and talks about how evil they are, you know, a, you know, a pitchfork baddie that's going around sitting there saying, I'm evil, follow me, or someone that says, hey, I'm good, I could give you these great things. Follow me and I could give you the desires of your heart. Which one are you going to be more drawn to? This is why we have to be aware of Satan and his demons. We have to have the correct thinking about them. You know, there's two wrong ways to think about good angels and bad angels. And I think a lot of us are really guilty. Either one of these two things, we can either be too obsessed with them or we could totally dismiss them. And both things are very dangerous to do when it comes to these things. Throughout the Bible, we can see, and I, there's so much that I could bring forth and I could put up here as scripture, but I already like bombarded these people with so much scripture that they're going to put up. I thought, I can't put up so much more. But there's so many scripture verses that talk about different times where there's demon possession. You, know, you can see young kids, young boys that actually have demon possession. You can see women that are deceived and, and have demon possession. You know, one that was falling around Paul when he was trying to do his work. And, you know, there's different times in the Bible we can see other men. And we can see there's a time where it actually shows that there's demons that are in a man. And actually Jesus comes up to him and says, you know, you must flee. And they asked to be put into animals. And then they head over the cliff and the pigs all drown. So we can see that there's a lot of interesting things about that. Even some demons, that people that have one demon, and then there's other times where it says, no, there's a legion, a bunch of demons that are in one person. So there is something to really actually be paying attention to and thinking about. The idea that you have to understand is, like I've said before, you have to decide, when I say either you become too obsessed with them or you disregard them and don't take them serious, you have to understand for yourself whether or not you really truly believe the Bible or you don't. And I think this is what a lot of times people really just don't get. I'm a black or white person. I'm just straight up, you know, this is it. I'm a two with a one wing. If you don't know what that is, figure it out. It's the Enneagram, it's pretty interesting. But there is a right way in life and there is a wrong way in life and that's all there is to it. I believe if you are following God, then you should believe in God's word. The scriptures, you should believe what it says. And I think sometimes there's so many people that sit there and say that they're followers of God, they're, they're Christians, they're this, they're that, and then they don't actually relate their life to what the word says. Instead, they're living what the world says. If we think that God's word is holy and it's the authority, then we should be thinking about what it says and actually take it into account in our lives and follow after what he says. But it's up to you whether or not you believe it or not. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Do you believe that? Do you believe that there's evil? Do you believe that there is a fight between good and evil? Do you believe that there is a fight for your soul and for the souls of your family and friends, those you love? Do you believe it? Sometimes I think that we say we do, but I don't know if we necessarily really follow it as much as we say we do. I think so many of us really, when we think about demons, we're afraid somehow that they're going to come and possess us. They're just going to jump on us. I want you to know if you're a child of God that the demons can't jump on you, not unless you open the door to them. You can't. You can't be possessed. You know, I'm teaching this message. I've read more about demons than I ever wanted to. But I'm telling you, God has put in me the Holy Spirit that protects me from the enemy. If you have Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit living inside, you have nothing to fear because you have power and authority over them. You can <laughs> de demand they flee from you. Demand they flee from your house. I have walked the perimeter of my house. I've claimed it in the name of Jesus. There will be no evil that will ever walk in my door. No evil will walk in. I believe it 100%. When we first started the church, there was an interesting experience that I had. I always loved when we first started the church. We had such great opportunity. Like, we left, and we were just had a whole year of really just 
just reading the scriptures and just spending time together and, and studying God's word and getting prepared for what we were going to do with starting the church. I spent the whole summer just basically sitting by a campfire in my yard. It was like the best ever. Sit out there and read the Bible. And I remember there was a time where God just, I heard the audible voice of God. Where it actually, he said, good doesn't always recognize evil. But evil always recognizes good. See, the thing is, this is something for us to remember. And I know God gave us that because he knew where we were heading. We were headed to do some battle. Battle in the Illinois Valley. People that we thought maybe we could be friends and weren't friends. See, the thing is, if you're doing good, evil recognizes it and wants to tear you down. Remember that. This is a spiritual battle for your soul and for the souls of your children. Parents, I'm telling you, you better start protecting them. Protect them, guard them. You know how many times I've prayed over my kids? There'll be no evil that will ever take over their life. I pray for favor. I pray for blessings to be upon them. We have so much power that we don't take hold of because we don't read God's word for ourselves and hear it. This is great if you're hearing it today because you know what? This means that you can now do those things if you've never heard them before. But read for yourself. There's way more power there than what I can give you here. So like I said, there's so many people that think there's all these spirits can jump on them and hurt them. And if you're a child of God, it isn't going to happen. There are tactics, though. There's tactics that they will use to destroy us, our faith and our families. And you might be surprised how. And this is where I think a lot of people really fall victim to what the enemy would want. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, we read the story of an older demon who is counseling a younger demon, less experienced demon. And in it, he tells them, you will say that these are very small sins. Now understand, this is demons talking to another demon, trying to keep them away from God, okay? You will say that these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy who is God. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to keep the man away from the light. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, with su without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Understand that the demons and the enemies will use a slippery slope to cause your destruction. That allows the demons in many times. Satan and his demons are very crafty. They're very deceptive in how they go about their business. Sometimes you might be really seriously serving God. You're following God. And over time, you know, like reading less of the Bible because you're so busy. You know, you finally get a chance to relax at the end of the night. You're like, man, I don't want to read the Bible. I just want to be entertained is what I would rather do. Or, you know, money's tight, so I got to work more. I got to make more money. And so you spend less time with God, more time in the world. Understand many times what can pull us away from God and what can make us more receptive to the enemy is sometimes just the job, the sport you're involved in. Parents, kids involved in sports, if they never come to youth group, you're causing them destruction. And I'm not saying that just because I'm the youth pastor, but I am passionately passionate about youth because this is our next generation. We should be really caring because we're the protectors of them. Your job is to make the best choices for them when they're young. It's the sports. It's your house. It's your family. It's the weather. Like I said, you've got a perfect, you know, it has to be around like 50-some that you all get to come to church. If it's too cold, you don't come. If it's too hot, you don't come. You know, anywhere from 40 to like 55. The best weather ever for, for followers. I'm telling you. Money. Another person. Your hobbies, the entertainment, other things that a lot of times will cause us to slip away from our faith. Those are the slippery slopes, understand. 
This is what the younger demon needed to understand. How can I entice them? Anything that pulls them away from God. These things that a lot of times we would say are wonderful actually actually masquerade in our lives as light. We have to remember to protect ourselves. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. So it's a dangerous thing that can actually take place. This is what's tough because there's a lot of times I'm going to tell you, I'm going to break your guys' heart so many times last week and this week. It says some that can turn away from the true faith. This is where I say, I don't know where they get the idea that you can be once saved, always saved. See, the thing is, if we're truly saved, yes, he can't. You can never be snatched out of God's hands, ever. This is a true statement. However, we can let go of God's hand. Understand, he says, in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. Some will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12 says, When you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. Now you're like thinking, yeah, okay, I'm not going to do that. Well, I'm going to read a little farther, okay? This was a cultural thing. This actually did take place. People did this. They thought that they somehow were going to be blessed by this God if they did this. I don't know. I... Definitely think some people with the idea of maybe abortion and life not being meaningful might have some regard to this scripture. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering, and do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. I think the problem is in our world, we've definitely taken these things lightly. I mean, we are definitely entertained by psychics, by those that contact the dead. But yet, the Bible tells us that they are detestable to the Lord. This is where I say, I'm going to probably break a little bit of your hearts because there's some things that you guys probably are taking as very innocent and not destructive, but yet you are opening yourselves up to the enemy by allowing these things in your life. It's not good. It's not good. The devil and his demons believe in these, even if you don't understand that. Cultures all over the world believe this. All over the world, these cultures believe that these things open yourselves up to demons. And they believe and follow and report the effectiveness of the occult that's going on in the world. Doing these things, open yourselves up to demons. And demons desire for us to go closer to those things than it does to God. I can tell you, honestly and truthfully, that I really struggled with horoscopes. Horoscopes was something that I was really, really involved in. When I first became a believer, I was one of them that always consulted my horoscope. I was one that always looked into them and thought, what's this day going to be bringing? And whether or not I thought it was like serious or not at the beginning, you know, I just thought it was light fun. But I had a really interesting experience. There was a, an older woman that was actually at the church that we were at. I hardly had talked to her before. I started following after God. I know the kids were in their kids' ministry, and I was there in church, and I was, you know, listening to the message. And then at the end of the message, I had this woman come up to me who was an old saint, and she walked up to me, and she said to me, the Lord said you need to get rid of those horoscopes in your life. And I was like, whoa. I told no one that I was reading horoscopes at that time. No one. It was a kind of like a little secret thing I did, you know, where I looked at them and paid attention to them, and I wasn't really letting anybody know that I was kind of like drawn to it. But I had that moment right then, and I thought, man, man, if God could speak to this woman and come up to me and tell me something like that, this must be real. This woman wasn't alone with me in my house. She wasn't seeing what I was doing. 
So if the Lord told her this, I need to never do this again. And I have never, never once in my life yet ever have gone to horoscopes and looked at them again. Even if I've seen them in magazines, I skip over them. If I see them in the newspaper, skip over them. I don't pay attention to them. And you might think, well, that's pretty innocent. They're not that bad. Understand they are. They are. And if God actually caused a woman to come up to me and tell me this, I think he must think they are. Because, you know, the thing is, God had a plan for me to do something powerful for him. And I think he knew it was going to be something that would be an undoing of mine. It could cause me to not go the direction I was supposed to go, but instead be led astray and farther away from him. So he used this woman to talk to me about it. You know, we have to be mindful about what God's teaching us. If you feel ever an urge or this feeling, this like little like ugh, feeling when you look upon something, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of us that says, this is not for you. If you are a child of God, this is not for you. Don't take part in this. You know, the, the Bible forbids us from contacting the dead. And see, what's become real popular is this idea that we're going to, you know, consult these people that are going to talk to the dead. The Bible says that's wrong. The Bible says that seances are wrong. Playing with Ouija boards, wrong. All these things, horoscopes, they're wrong. They go against God. Instead of taking part and playing in the occult, we should be instead fighting Satan and his demons by tactics that God tells us we can use to fight the enemy, the enemies in our lives. We really have to take serious this battle that's going on around us. You understand, if he can take you out, he takes out those around you. He takes out your, your kids around you because there's no power. He could take out your friends. There's people that you're supposed to be able to reach you might never reach because you went the wrong direction. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Now I'm going to tell you some really interesting things. This is important. This is what you need to understand and learn. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. I ended with that phrase, stay alert, right? Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. First Peter says it again. 5.8, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. devour. Understand this. You know, in the Bible, people are always saying, well, it's not so bad. You know, I can drink. Yes, you can have a drink. But this is why it's so dangerous to be drunk. This is why God speaks against drunkenness, speaks against anything that could alter our minds, drugs, uh, alcohol, pornography, those things that we allow in, violence, all those different things that we allow into our mind. Understand, God says, stay alert, because those things do open ourselves up to more evil. I don't understand being entertained by violence as a Christian. I don't. You know, I might be one of those old souls that just say, you're like, well, you're old, you don't understand. No, I'm a follower of God, and I do everything I can to protect myself. I'm not going to be entertained by violence when God says it's, a, it's something that he finds detestable. It's important for us to remember, you know how many times, oh, I can tell you, your kids tattle on you. You know how many times I've listened to teenagers and my things sit there and tell me, yeah, we watched this movie and I'm like, why? Why? If your parents say their fathers are God, are you watching slasher movies? What good can come of that? What good can come out of violence like that? What, what person, any person, especially if Father God needs to see someone just be like hung up, sliced in half? What good is that? 
I'm telling you, he says, the eyes are the windows to the soul. The eyes are the windows to your soul. Do you understand what you allow in affects who you are? It has an effect on you. It has an effect on you. You think it does. And I'm going to tell you, there's two, two visions you'll never, ever lose in your mind, ever, when you see them. Starting out from the time you're very small to the time you die, you will never forget a violent image, and you will never forget sexual images. They're there. They make these deep grooves in your brain. They're just there, and you fall back into those grooves and those ruts in your life. Protect your eyes. Guard your eyes. This is evil. This is the stuff that demons and Satan's loves. Why would you want to entertain yourself with this stuff? Stay alert. Stay alert. If you do that, I can tell you guys, you'll win. You'll win because God wins. If we follow him, we'll do the same thing and we will win. Our families will win. I truly believe that's the reason why my kids serve Jesus. Is because we fought the enemy in our house. We didn't allow certain things to come in there. I prayed over that, and I'll tell you, I did everything I could. We never, my kids have never seen, my kids, my kids, understand my kids are 38 and 35. My kids still this day have not seen horror movies. They never saw one because I never allowed them to. When Cameron was in high school, he was asked by so many times well, around Halloween, it's like, we're all just going to get together, all of us kids, and we're going to get together, we're going to watch something. I said, what are you going to watch? We're going to watch it on Friday the 13th. And I said, he's not going. He's not going. You know why? Because I didn't allow it in his head. I didn't allow it to get to his heart. I did everything I could to protect him from violence. I didn't want him to see it. And I think it made a difference because I think God had a plan for his life and my daughter's life to serve and to follow after Jesus and then to raise children and other children and more children to follow after Jesus. This is what God wants for you. You're no different. I can't, I can't ask you enough to start protecting your families, protect your children. I'm passionate about kids. I love my kids. I love my grandkids. I love your kids. When they come to be with me, I love them. I do everything I can to protect and guard their hearts. When I look at them, I think what they could be. They could be so good. They could be so powerful for the kingdom if you do your part along with me. Because I get a half an hour, an hour tops. You guys get them all the rest of the time. I'm passionate about it. I love those kids. I want there to be more and more kids following after Jesus. I want us to have a great revival like we sing about. I want us to have this revival, but we're not going to have it unless we guard ourselves. It's so important. We have to. I went off on a tangent. Like I said, I told you I was going to be a little long today. But I'm telling you, it's so important. It's so important. We have to understand that Satan and his demons are powerful forces. Never take them lightly. However, never forget what God says of him himself. In Isaiah 40, 25, he says, To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asked the Holy One. No one. No one's the equal of God. He is the creator of all things. It is him. He is above all things. He is the most powerful. No equal. He's omnipotent. He's an omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's, he can do all things. Why do we want to give the enemy power in our lives when we have the most powerful being that lives inside of us, God? Why? Satan and his demons are just created beings. They're not the creator. This is a great reminder for you. God is the most powerful. He created all things, all things. He's conquered the enemy, and he lives forever. And then he promises us the same thing if we would do things according to his plan instead. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, this is the time. I'm telling you, this is the beginning. This is the starting point. Go back, throw all the other stuff away that you took part in, and, and say, I'm going to follow after Jesus. I'm going to make him Lord of my life. I'm going to serve him. He's going to be king. What he tells me, what his word says, I'm going to do. 
Ask for forgiveness. Believe that he's the son of God. If you've never done that, he's just such a whisper away. He's just a whisper. I mean, all you have to do is just start repeating his name. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And he says he'll rush in. He'll go into your heart. He'll purify it. He'll change the things that were evil. He'll turn it around. He'll turn your life. But then he says, follow me. Follow me. See, that's the problem that Christians quit a lot of times doing. They accept him and then they quit following him because they don't read his word. They don't spend time praising him. They don't do the things that actually cause us to keep Jesus in sight. We lose him. We lose him. James 4, 7 through 10 says, So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. There's something good about tears of asking for forgiveness, man. Right now, I want to give you an opportunity. If you have never asked Jesus to forgive you, maybe you've taken part in those things. Maybe you've taken, taken part of the idea of like, you know, seeing violent images and you think, okay, I, I have done that and maybe I shouldn't have done it. Or maybe you've, you've taken part in this idea of like maybe being entertained by violence or, or even getting involved watching shows about seances and contacting the dead or even involved in horoscopes, which you might think aren't dangerous, but they're based on their stars and the creation, which were God's creation. He is supreme above them. If you've done that, if you need forgiveness, we don't have a Marie Matchell around here walking up to you anymore. That's who walked up to me. But you know what? We have an altar right here. If you need forgiveness, and no one's going to look down upon you, we all sin, all fall short of the glory of God. If you need forgiveness for that, I ask you today, come up and ask God to forgive you. We'll be here with you. We can pray with you afterwards. Don't leave and think it doesn't matter. It matters with everything in your life. Understand that. Let me pray for you. God, you are so good, so wonderful, so glorious. When we spend time in your presence, when we're praising you, when we listen to these words that praise you, Lord, help us to mean them from our hearts. Help us to mean them from our spirits. I pray, Father, that you, Lord, would just help us to feel that conviction, maybe that sadness and that gloom that your word says if we know we've been going farther away from you. Help us, Lord God, to feel that, that weight upon us, that we need to be changed people so that we could change people. Lord, I pray that you would help us. I pray that this is a fresh start for somebody today that they would look at their lives and think that there's a better way in which to follow, which is your way, God. We thank you for all things that you're going to do and how you're going to change us. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.